not compensate by accepting the loan offers of the EU Bank or others. The EIB group will, in addition to its normal business, increase significantly its lending activity at the risk end and mobilize, we are sure, far more than 300 billion additional of private capital over the next three years in modernizing Europe's economy and supporting growth and employment. This figure of 315 billion, I mean, this sounds so, so pseudo-precise, but it's simply the multiplication of uh, 21 by the factor 15, which we consider the minimum we will achieve. Uh, but this figure sounds probably quite huge, might sound artificial in its anticipated accuracy, and it might sound like alchemy, but at the end, the figure is the result of pure mathematics, uh, which I've just described. A factor, by the way, which we believe is realistic. When we implemented the increase of the 10 billion paid in capital to EIB, of, to EIB, which the heads of state and government decided back in 2012, we promised at this time to mobilize an additional 180 billion of private investments within three years, hence calculating a factor 18. Thank you very much. The three years given to us in order to achieve that goal will end at the 31st of December this year, and I can report to you that by the 25th of March, we had reached the 180 billion. So this is done, and had we simply continued, we would have ended at a factor of far beyond 25 uh, under these circumstances. But as I said before, this is not now the issue anymore. Now the issue is risk-bearing capacity and not liquidity. So we delivered, and this makes us optimistic that we will be able to deliver on the investment plan for Europe, though of course the increase and the structure of the new projects will be challenging. <clears throat> but though the governance structure of FC is just about to get into place, we just nominated, or the parliament uh, confirmed, the managing director and this deputy. Uh, we have the steering board in place. The investment committee will be put into place this week. So by the end of the year, we will have approved higher risk projects already of approximately 9 billion euros generating around 44 billion of investment. So without the, the, the management and the systems fully operational yet, by the end of the year, we will have mobilized already rough, roughly 50 billion out of the 315 promised. So we are quite optimistic. <coughs> this was only possible due to our decision not to wait for the governance structure to get into place, but to start with the rollout of the Juncker plan in substance as quick as possible by the so-called warehousing of projects. Uh, we were criticized for this by the European Parliament, but we re buff rebuked that criticism because uh, we were asked by the European Council not to wait, but to make sure that first visible signs come into play very, very soon. And in order to achieve this, we decided in our normal due diligence process about the quality of the projects, took these projects onto the balance sheet of the bank with the hope of shifting them one day under the umbrella of the Juncker Plan Guarantee once the institution is fully established. Of these projects, around half support renewable energy, energy efficiency, and other investments that contribute to low carbon growth. The others include R&D and industrial innovation, digital and social infrastructure, transport, as well as access to finance for smaller companies. In parallel, the European Investment Fund our subsidiary, which we organized together with the European Commission. We are the 60% shareholder. The Commission has 30 and national promotional banks and others share the rest of the, the remaining 10%. The EIF is delivering impressive results in favor of smaller businesses as part of the Juncker Plan. The EIF has already signed more than 50 operations with total financing under FC of around 1.2 billion, with, which is expected to trigger more than 70 billion of investments. Some 65,000 SMEs are expected to benefit throughout the whole European Union. And furthermore, we need to be aware that FC, as integral part of EIB, will account only for roughly one-third of EIB's activities. We must not neglect delivering on the other two-thirds, as we need to mobilize around 200 million, a billion euros of private investments on a yearly basis. And second, we are enhancing our advisory activities within the framework of the so-called European Advisory Hub. When I arrived here at the bank in 2012, 
I was overwhelmed by the wealth of expertise this bank has to offer when it comes also to the technical assessment of a project. You will not find a bank in the world with a broader base of engineering and natural science capacity than, than in Luxembourg. Every investment must not be when it comes to environmental, social and legal implications. Many private and public investors rely on the technical expertise of EIB, not only taking EIB involvement as a proof of a sound project, but also relying on the technical advice the EU Bank has to offer. And we are enhancing our advising activities, for example, by widening the scope of some instruments like TRESPAS to all member state states, but also by offering our support with a new advisory hub. And now that we celebrate 10 years of JASPERS very soon, we can say that uh, here in Central and Eastern Europe, JASPERS has proven its worth. And uh, when I addressed the European Council uh, three years ago in June, uh, I told them uh, it is time to get away from the differentiation between old and new Europe. And we have to look at the needs of the European countries and regions and you will find out that there are regions in Central and Eastern Europe which are so far advanced now that justice activities are simply not needed anymore, while in parts of Spain or France it is urgently needed to offer these services there as well. So this is why the uh, finance ministers and the European Council have agreed to extend the justice activities to all member states who are in need. That should be the criterion, not the old differentiations. And we are uh, will continue to do that now with the advisory hub. The third strand of the Juncker plan is all about removing barriers of investment. In this part, the ball lies more in the field of the member states. However, EIB can contribute by identifying these barriers we come across in our daily business with clients or within our advisory, advisory capacity. Concrete results and impact on the real economy will be significant if these three pillars are equally addressed, unlocking investment capacity and deepening the European Union. Four main domains. I've mentioned strategic invest infrastructure and innovation at the beginning at the, as, the two pillar, as two pillars of EIB's activity. The remaining pillars are the support for SMEs. Nowadays, speaking in terms of volume, the largest pillar, which only shows the necessity of EIB being present in those markets most really severely hit by the debt crisis. Last year, we had 265,000 SMEs in the new portfolio across the entire European Union. And when the bank was founded in 1958, nobody would have even dreamt of having EIB activities in the field of SMEs. At that time, it was exclusively an infrastructure bank after everybody could see the ruins of World War II. I just visited Nicosia and Athens this week. In Cyprus, our exposure amounts to 14.2% of Cypriot GDP, 14.2%. In Greece, we were active in the country when the crisis hit its peak, and no other bank was ready to give loans in the country anymore. We stayed, and from 2012 to 2013, we even managed to triple our activity. Our overall exposure to, amounts to 17 billion euros, which is just below 10% of the Greek GDP, an enormous amount. These figures show that our lending to SMEs is crucial for the economies of these member states in order to support sustainable growth and deployment. It doesn't make sense to lament about the difficulties the so-called institutions are constantly facing with the Greek government and the Greek authorities if you don't address the questions of the real economy. And those who have good ideas, have good products, and sometimes are severely hit by constraints which the market necessarily or unnecessarily brings about when pursuing their businesses. It's heartbreaking to see how many well-functioning, perfectly future-oriented, innovative businesses in, in Greece are hampered to make progress because of this. And therefore, we concentrate more than ever on this kind of our activities in Greece in order to take care of the real economy and not just talking about state finances. We are not a state financer anyway, so we are targeted at the real economy. But it's not, not only these countries in which the SMEs have difficulties getting uh, access to finance, as I mentioned before. Last, but definitely not least, we are very active when it comes to climate policies. We are a treaty-based institution. The Treaty on European Union tells us what to do since it was written in 1956 and enacted in 1958. 
The Treaty on the European Union says the EU Bank is there in order to contribute what we would in modern language call the completion of the internal market. And secondly, is there in order to level out differences in the economic development in the regions of the then beginning European economic community because at that time it was evident that we were parts of the European communities which benefited less from the Marshall Plan, plan than other parts of, the, of Western Europe at that time. And since then, our objectives are being set by the decisions of the European Council. And climate action is now a decisive objective of the European Union, set out in the decisions of the European Council, so we pursue them. And uh, on our road to Paris, I've just recently announced in Lima during the IMF World Bank meeting that we will increase our lending supporting climate action in the developing countries, that is where the effect of climate project is the highest from 25 to, 20, to 35 percent until 2020. And our lending activities within the European Union are targeted clearly and consequently uh, at uh, 25 percent uh, supporting climate action. I will conclude by saying that despite the many crises in Europe, I remain a structural optimist. And I'm sure that we will find solutions. But we need more exploitations of the options the market offers us when it comes to bringing scarce public resources and private funds together. We need intelligent instruments, sound instruments to do that. And we need, to be quite honest, more European thinking and more European 